Some organisms, like sea turtles and oak trees, reproduce many times throughout their lives, whereas other organisms, like peas, salmon, mayflies, and caluta, reproduce only once. Why is this? How should organisms reproduce anyway? Life history theory, a subfield within evolution and ecology, can provide some insight. Life history theory examines the trade-offs between survival and reproduction, and one aspect of this is semi-parity versus iteroparity, how often to reproduce. Semi-parity describes a reproductive strategy in which organisms undergo a single reproductive event during their life, whereas iteroparity describes a reproductive strategy in which organisms undergo multiple reproduction events over the course of their lives. I should point out that the terms annual and perennial tend to be used instead when discussing plants, but the concept is the same. To think about this semi-parity iteroparity question, consider a population with two genetically caused strategies. In other words, a population in which some individuals are semiparous and some are iteroparous. If the fitness of the strategies differ, then selection would favor the switch from the lower fitness one to the higher fitness one for the entire population, as the higher fitness individuals have more offspring and their genes take over the population in the long term. This is an interesting question, but how to model this? The answer is with math. The first mathematical model we'll look at is an influential one proposed by Lamont Cole. In this model, we consider a population of individuals with heritable variation for the two strategies. We'll model how fast a population of individuals with each strategy would grow using the equation shown. In this equation, the size of the population in the next time step is represented by capital N prime, and it comes from the number of adults in the previous population, represented by the capital N, plus the total number of new individuals due to births, represented by the BN term, minus the number of individuals lost to death, represented by the DN term. The values of B and D are the per individual, per time step rates of birth and death respectively. The length of our time step will be how long it takes to go from birth to adulthood. We could compare populations that have different values for B and D by starting them from the same initial population N and then calculating what the value of N prime would be. Whichever population gets the higher N prime value would be the one that grows faster. If we think of a combined population, a population with two subpopulations, the fastest growing subpopulation would have higher fitness and eventually become the population norm as it replaces the slower growing subpopulation. For two iteroparous subpopulations, more births and lower deaths both give a higher growth rate. However, if there's a trade-off between these two factors, increased births also increase the death rate, for example, the exact number of additional births needed to offset the additional deaths might require some calculation. But let's think about our original question by thinking about what it would take to switch from an iteroparous strategy to a semiparous one. In this case, the extra births could conceivably be maximized since future survival isn't necessary and the death rate could go all the way up to one. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. The first thing we'll do with Cole's model is simplify the math a little. Here's the starting equation from earlier. First, let's rearrange the terms to move the death term next to the initial population. Then we combine the n minus dn term into 1 minus d in parentheses times n as shown. Now we'll substitute the value p in for the 1 minus d term. d was the per individual death rate, so 1 minus d gives the per individual survival rate for each adult individual. This is the equation we'll use to compare the iteroparous and semiparous strategies. Now let's see what our equation looks like for our two life history strategies. First, the semiparous strategy. Note that the birth rate is now represented by a b sub s, indicating that this is the birth rate for the semiparous individuals. For semiparous reproduction, the adults only reproduce once, so their survival is essentially zero because they sacrifice themselves, or at the very least, no longer participate in future reproduction. This means that the p term is zero, which gives us n prime equals b sub s times n. Now the iteroparous strategy, with the birth rate represented by b sub i, the birth rate for the iteroparous individuals. To keep things simple, and because mortality for many adults is low from year to year, we'll set the value of p to be 1. This gives us n prime equals n plus b sub i times n, which we can rearrange to n prime equals 1 plus b sub i in parentheses times n. To compare our strategies, we compare these equations for the same starting n value. Now for the result of Cole's model. Our equations for the semiparous and iteroparous strategies are shown here. Now we set them equal to each other and solve for the minimum b sub s value that would allow the semiparous strategy to equal or exceed the fitness of the iteroparous strategy. Plugging in our two equations gives us this equality. 
Canceling the n on both sides gives us this final result for the birth rate of the Semoparis individuals that would give them equal population growth and fitness to the Iteroparis ones. Semoparis organisms will have equal fitness to the Iteroparis ones if they have just one extra baby during a sacrificial reproduction, and they'll have higher fitness if they can manage two or more. By not saving any energy for future survival, it should be easy for many animals and plants to squeeze out just two or more extra offspring. Based on this, why isn't everything Semoparis? Almost immediately, Cole's model ran into problems. This model predicted that almost everything should evolve semoparity, but that's obviously not what we see in nature. Nevertheless, the model lasted 19 years, from 1954 to 1973, because the math was correct and you can't argue with math. Well, you can, but only within the rules of math, and Cole didn't really violate any of those. Over time, some people did identify specific problems with the model, however. The model may not apply to organisms with parental care, because if the adults sacrifice themselves, their offspring wouldn't survive. It might apply if the sacrifice isn't total, though, saving enough energy to take care of the young and just giving up future reproduction. More importantly, the model is ignoring some mathematical terms it should have. This model ignores Iteroparis adult mortality. That is, we set p to equal 1, which assumes that every adult survives. This isn't realistic for many species. This model ignores both Iteroparis and Semoparis juvenile mortality. The model includes births, but not how many of the young make it to adulthood and their own reproduction. This brings us to the next step, fixing the model by adding the missing mortality terms. In 1973, Sharnoff and Schaffer published a paper in which they revisited Cole's model, but added in the adult and juvenile mortality terms. I've put a link in the video description to a paper that describes this in more detail, but these are the basics. For the Semoparis strategy, we add in a juvenile survival term, the capital C sub s. We will still assume that the adult survival rate is zero, and we get the equation n prime equals b sub s times c sub s times n. For the Iteroparis strategy, we add in both an adult and juvenile survival term, capital P sub i for the adult survival, and capital C sub i for the juvenile survival. Now that the adult survival rate is not one, it stays in the final equation we get. N prime equals, in parentheses, P sub i plus B sub i times C sub i, all multiplied by N. To simplify things a little, since this is a single mutation we're thinking about, we'll assume that the juvenile survival probabilities are the same, capital C. Now we'll do the same thing Cole did, compare when these equations are equal for the same starting N. Now for the result of Sharnoff and Schaffer's improved version of Cole's model. The new equations for the Semoparis and Iteroparis strategies are shown here. Now we set them equal to each other and solve for the minimum b sub s value that would allow the Semoparis strategy to equal or exceed the fitness of the Iteroparis strategy. Remember that we're replacing c sub s and c sub i with c. This gives us b sub s times c times n equals, in parentheses, p sub i plus b sub i times c, end parentheses, times n. Canceling the capital N on both sides gives us b sub s times c equals p sub i plus b sub i times c. Dividing both sides by c gives us b sub s equals p sub i plus b sub i times c, all divided by c. And writing this out in two terms and flipping the order gives us b sub s equals b sub i plus p sub i divided by c. Looking at our final equation, we see that semoparous organisms must have p sub i divided by c more offspring to have equal fitness, not just one like from before. The value of p sub i divided by c depends on the organism's lifestyle. Let's look at this equation in more detail. The switch from iteroparity to semoparity is favored when the organism can easily have p sub i divided by c more offspring. When is this value small? That is, when is it easily doable with a single change caused by mutation? When juvenile survival probability C is large, the second term will be small, and the semoparis organism doesn't need to have too many more offspring to equal the fitness of the iteroparis. When adult survival probability, P sub i, is small, the second term will be small as well. A third point that doesn't come directly from the equation, but is also a factor to consider, is how this increase in birth rate compares to the starting value. In species with large broods, having extra offspring is more feasible. For example, if p sub i over c was 20, then going from 100 to 120 is easier than going from 1 to 21. The kiwi shown there would be hard pressed to increase the number of exit lays because there just isn't room for more. Now that we have this result, let's ask ourselves which creatures are semoparis. 
For the Kaluta, the adults may well have a low survival probability, but if the litters of offspring can be raised in safety, then the P divided by C term may be small. This is relatively unusual, however. More often, we see semel parity in organisms with large broods and low adult survival probability. Annual plants like peas can make lots of seeds, and each plant faces a real risk of being eaten and dying. The low P sub I value for the plants favors a switch from a perennial to an annual lifestyle. Salmon have to make a long journey up a river which is full of danger, so their P sub I value would be low and the eggs they lay are so small that making enough for semel parity to work is possible even with the low juvenile survival probability. On the other hand, sea turtles are very unlikely to turn semel paris anytime soon. Even though they lay large clutches of eggs, they have a very high adult survival probability and a low juvenile survival probability, so the number of additional eggs they would have to lay is prohibitive. To recap, Cole's argument lasted 19 years, but it implied that almost everything should be semel paris, which is not true. But the math was correct, and math is truth. Sharnoff and Schaffer discovered the hidden, or implicit, assumptions, and derived a result that makes more sense. This is the main benefit of mathematical models. All the assumptions are listed, or are discoverable by which terms are and are not included, and there are widely accepted rules for getting results. Cole's model isn't wrong for systems that don't experience juvenile or adult mortality, but if we want to understand systems that do have those things, then we need to include those terms in the mathematical model. Since a mathematical model has to be 100% clear about what is and is not included, this allows for conflict resolution. Metaphors and verbal models lack this benefit. When people use verbal models, like saying the national budget is like your household budget, that's too vague. The national budget differs in many ways from a personal budget, but until you write down a concrete mathematical model, you can't identify what aspects are being omitted. Likewise, when people argue that lowering taxes will boost the economy because of some economic model, they're making assumptions about spending and people's behaviors. But unless they write those down, the assumptions can't be examined, compared to real-world data, and truly debated. When verbal models and metaphorical models like these are used, they completely lose the main benefit of mathematical models, and there can be no conflict resolution. Finally, there are two different types of mathematical models. There are conceptual models, where the goal is to understand the system with a simple model, not to make 100% accurate specific predictions. And there are applied models, where the goal is to make very accurate predictions, even if we no longer understand the more complicated model completely. The model we've been looking at is obviously a conceptual model, since it didn't include lots of other important things like other species, spatial effects, climate variability, food resource variation, and any number of other things that are important in the real world. Nevertheless, it is useful for helping us understand the life history strategies that different organisms employ. These two different types of models are used all the time, not just in biology. For example, if you've taken basic chemistry, you learned about the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, which expresses the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature for an enclosed gas. This equation is useful for learning about how these three factors interact but it's inaccurate for larger molecules because it assumes gas molecules are point particles that don't interact. It also doesn't predict the Joule-Thompson effect whereby most gases cool down when they're forced through a tight nozzle. This equation, the real gas law, or van der Waals equation, is more accurate and does predict the Joule-Thompson effect. This is because it takes into account the van der Waals attractions between molecules, that's in the first set of parentheses, and the fact that the molecules themselves take up some of the space in the volume, that's in the second set of parentheses. This second equation is much less useful as a conceptual model because it's too complicated. But it is absolutely the kind of model you need to use if you're a chemical engineer and need to make accurate predictions for important practical purposes, like designing an oil refinery that doesn't explode. Both types of models have their place in science. I hope you found this foray into semel parity, iterative parity, and mathematical modeling interesting, either because you like seeing how we can get a better understanding of why organisms reproduce the way they do, or because you like math. It's probably the reproduction. YouTube uses a complicated applied mathematical model to decide which videos to suggest to viewers. Liking, sharing, and subscribing will help this video and channel get shown to more people because those mathematical terms, and many others, are in the YouTube applied model. 